what we've got here is failure to communicate. Hey, I'm UFC President Dana White, and you're in the ring with Callum McGregor. To me, the Lions are the number one rankings out there. Those guys are the ones who really do their homework, you know what I mean? But this fight, I'm telling you, it's a flip of a coin. I we did not tap. Um, Let's go! So Let's go! Your ultimate fighter winner, Elias Theodoro! Okay, here we go. Another week of fights coming off of a big pay-per-view. Um, the crazy shit that went on. We recorded like 16 different podcasts last week, as did everybody. Um, you can see on Twitter, everybody like updating. I'm, I'm coming up with a, a, you know, a show here. Like There was so much scrambling going on. Um, and then we sort of move into the week and get hit with some pretty shitty news. Um, if you want to just look over my shoulder here to the man, uh, Elias Teodoro. You know, the guy um, basically didn't let anybody really know that he was, he was battling. And I know that he was battling, I think they said liver cancer, but there's possibilities that it may have been colon cancer. And it, you know, it, we don't need to really even find that out. It's, it, the relevance was, it was stage four, it hit him hard. Um, and it's just sad, man. I mean, he, he became a big brother to a lot of fighters in Ontario. He helped bring a lot of fighters along and bring a lot of fighters up. I know Todd Stout, big, big friend. Um, he was able to help with uh, Aaron Jeffrey as well, too. And the guy really, I think his record in, in the UFC was eight and two, you know, and, and I get it. Like people would shit on him for his style. He even made reference to that in his ultimate fighter speech. Um, but he would blanket guys at the times and then he would outpoint them on the feet. And it, like it's sure he didn't necessarily knock guys out all the time, but it was up for up to them to, to beat him. And they weren't, you know, and he ended up it wasn't just because the UFC was cutting him for any specific reason. I think it was a lot to do with his exemption to marijuana. Um, he needed some, uh, an exemption for marijuana use due to, I think it was a neurological issue in his hand, I believe it was. And with that, you know, he fought and he, he actually gave up a potential, you know, re-signing back in the UFC in order to go out on, you know, what he believed in. And he fought for, you know, legally and publicly um, to get exemption for, you know, a medical exemption for marijuana for a pro athlete. And he got it, you know, in his last fight, he was actually likely, you know, had cancer, wins his last fight um, as an exempt athlete and sort of conquers that final goal for himself. And, you know, what a way to go out for him. And then silently, we, we didn't know about it, but uh, silently he battles with cancer. And, you know, I don't want to go on too long and, and make this too somber but you can see it hit the community pretty hard because he seemed like he was just I didn't know him personally I know a lot of people that know him and, and train with him and he just seemed like the happy-go-lucky guy that um everybody loved to be around so pretty shitty news um rest in peace Elias Teodoro um if you have any words you wanted to say or anything that you had saw on Twitter or whatever else yeah, man. Well, I think you summed it up pretty perfectly. Like Elias was a real big thing for the Canadian MMA scene. Just to respect the fact that, you know, you had like the bigger up there's like the GSPs of the world. But like Elias was always an advocate for the scene. And like anything else, man, if you're part of a music scene, you're part of anything, you know, you want to be surrounded by the people that really want to see you grow and improve. And from everything we've heard and everything we've seen over the last week, like Elias was definitely that guy. Although I said he had his ups and downs in the UFC everything despite that like he always wanted to see his team grow and prosper and from what i heard and i'm sure what you heard you know first one in the gym and was always there to help out his teammates when they needed them help so you know as i said like you got to give the guy a lot of respect man like you know he went out on a shield as you said what i heard the same thing you did that it was colon cancer that led to liver cancer i heard that it was a very short period between the time that he got that fatal news in between the time that he passed away and, you know, good for him, man. He went out the same way he came in and that's fighting. And that's, you know, that, that's all you can stand by. Right. He wasn't looking for any handouts. He wasn't looking for any sympathy. You know, he didn't want anybody to sit there and be concerned about his health. And as I said, man, like it takes a lot of balls to not reach out for support and your dying moments, you know? So. If it teaches and, us anything, man, it, it's uh Life's fragile, you know, man. When you, when you have so, yeah, man. When, when someone's 34 years old, life is fragile. And I mean, me, at, now I'm at, I'm at 38 years old and certain examinations, certain things that you have to start doing and start looking at, man. And you have to start taking care of your health. 
Um, and one thing even coming out of the pandemic is, you know, a lot of us aren't even fully still connected with families, myself included. Um, time is fragile. It's, mm -hmm. it's wavering. It, it's, we don't know who's going to be here tomorrow. So let's get to it and get back um, to the fights. And, and so I don't turn into a, a you know, a slobbering, a slobbering little bitch because, you know, I'm a soft girl dad. Um, <laughs> but uh, let's jump right into the fights. We have a pretty exciting main event. I'm pretty excited. Um, no easy task for Song Yudong's first main event. That is for sure. Fighting, I, I would say what would be the, I would say possibly one of the best strikers in the UFC. I think one of the most dynamic strikers um, in Corey Sanag. And Corey Sanag and really, I don't know how you see this fight going right now. What, what do we have as the odds? I don't have the odds up here, but I know that, uh, you know, at 14-4, I know Corey Sanag gets coming up against the 19-6-1, so a little bit more of a, a pedigreed career for Song Yudong that way. But I just think there's going to be levels to the stand-up here, and I think that unfortunate for Song Yudong, um, he may play into a lot of what Corey wants. Uh, what are the lines currently sitting up for this one? Uh, right now, Corey sitting at a minus-195 favorite with the return on Song Yudong at a plus-165. Yeah, I mean, I just think that that Corey is so dynamic in his movement, his footwork, and then also giving you different looks at all times. You just don't know what the hell is going to happen. Um, yeah, he's lost to Dillashaw and 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 Jan, but I mean, I would argue that he maybe beat Dillashaw in that fight. I had green green colored glasses at the time, and I was on the Dillashaw side of it. Um, but either way, if you went back and forth, those two losses are so valuable for how good, how more of an amazing fighter um, he is only going to become and, and learn from. He's young. Those kind of battles that early in his career um, definitely is only going to increase his stock. So we have Corey Sandhagen coming in against the powerful Song Yudong, who really in his last fight against Marais, um, we were all sort of leaning in that way, but I didn't see him coming out like that, man. I know a, a, a Marais KO isn't necessarily as big as some of the other KOs, and that's no shot at him. It's just, unfortunately, the guy goes out in his shield and late in his career was just chin-checked quite, quite too many times. Um, Yudong's got power, but he has those sort of slightly looping shots. They're a little bit tighter than more, more so than some guys that throw really wide shots. But I think that's where the exposure is going to happen. I think when he goes forward and tries to throw what he throws, um, he's just going to be able to be picked apart at pretty much almost any point. And I'm not trying to shoot it on too hard. I just don't think that there really is a spot here that he maybe if he wants to try to get into the wrestling. But I know that um, right now, Sandhagen has been working with Ryan Hall and his jujitsu. So and his jiu-jitsu was already good to go with. So I, I don't really know where there's a spot for Yudong. And this is a pretty hard, hard sell for me on this one. But if you saw something in tape, I mean, sure, there always is a, a potential mistake and and, and a, a chin check on Yudong's side in the KO. But, you know, with Corey coming in, at, he throws about six and a half strikes landed per minute. And he's absorbing four and a half. So he's pretty defensively sound. What's your take on this one? I'm high on Corey in this spot, man. The one thing that deters me, though, speaking of lines, is the fact that he's only a one uh, minus uh, 195 favorite. Like, there's been a lot of public money that's come in on Song Yudong, and it kind of confuses me. Like, I don't really know where people think Song Yudong wins this. Like, I expected Corey to be a three to one favorite. And for anybody who knows, like, Whenever I do tape study, I don't look at lines because it kind of confuses me into who I believe should be the favorite. I look at the fights. I look at the fights I want to watch, and then I make my opinions, and then I look at the betting angle <laughs> from it. And, like, I was pleasantly surprised at the line we're getting on Corey because he's got the better striking. He's got the better output. He arguably has the better wrestling, too, because, like, even if you look at his past fights, like going against Peter Yon, Peter Yon really struggled with the takedowns. TJ Dillashaw. You can't convince me TJ won that fight. Like, I will go through this, and this is a hill I'm willing to die on, that TJ capitalizing on his spinning attacks I and holding him. on that one. Sorry. I, yeah, that's great. People <laughs> cast on Daniel Rodriguez beating uh, – Daniel Rodriguez winning this, uh, this weekend. Doesn't mean he won that fight. And yeah. that's where I'm at with this one. So whatever the judges did what they had to do, but – to me, Corey arguably should be in TJ's position right now. So I just think that he's levels above Song Yudong. Um, Song Yudong is young and his future is bright, but I think this is a giant step up in competition. If you look at his past fights, as you mentioned, against Marlon Moraes, 
Marlon Moraes was so far from being still in the UFC. Like they, he kind of just needed that one more KO loss and Song Yidong got a power right hook. He's going to be the one to do it. But beating fighters like Andre Ewell and stuff like that, like it doesn't really give you the same caliber, right? Corey's last fights have been against Aljamain Sterling, TJ Dillashaw, uh, Peter Yawn. Like he's just fighting the upper echelon. He's looking good doing it, whether he's getting the W or not. So I think Corey Sanhagen, I think Corey Sanhagen all day. Um, you don't even really need to prop hunt on this one because, you know, at minus 195, I think you're getting a very, very fair line on somebody who I think should be like a three to one favorite. Just humor me on this one because I'm probably going to just just go money line. That's the safest way to do it. Likely could win my decision, but what's that prop for uh, submissions to have right now? For Corey? Mm-hmm. Plus 900. Obviously, I don't think it'll be a work to submission. I think it would be like a clubbed and sub neck grab type thing, but hmm. I don't hate right. that. I don't hate hey, that you either, honestly, but, if you definitely... think that because my thing with Corey is right, like I feel like Corey could also finish this fight, which is why I'm like hesitant on betting on any props on this. Because as I said, with dynamic striking like that, you could win. Um, if you're on the Song Yudong side, you could also bet the under 4.5 at plus 130 just because Song Yudong is not going to win a decision here. So if you think he's going to potentially win, but you're kind of hesitant on it, playing the under dot kind of covers both angles per se. Because I personally believe Corey wins inside the distance. I think Song Yudong showed to fade late in fights, and he's never been in a five-round fight. So I, I personally think that it's be like a Corey 4-5 KO maybe decision. But um, I don't hate the under at plus money. Okay, yeah, and I mean, the under's a nice play. I definitely like that. But I think the, the the smartest play was your first play you, you broke down. That was the money line. Then drop yeah. the, you know, the under and then go from there. Um, next fight on the card, we have Chidi Anjikawani, um against Gregory Rodriguez. So we have Chidi Anjikawani coming off of a, you know, a rise from the ashes of a career that where, you know, he just was on the outside looking in a little bit. And, you know, he beat Souza, who um, is now – someone who we, we realize just isn't quite where he needs to be. Yeah. After he lost actually last night in Dana White contender series again, um, poor shoulder, his shoulder is definitely gone after that submission. Um, but let's get back to this fight. If we're looking at it, I think honestly, GD and Kwani, although he's had a great rise over uh, to Dorovich, um, knocks out uh, Biro, Mark, Mark Andre Biro in a pretty crazy fashion early in that first round. Um, but I don't know, man. I think right now, what's the line currently sitting out on this one? Chitty right now no? is minus 125 with the return on okay. Gregory at a plus 105. It's, it'll be a pick by fight day for sure. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that he was criticized for for a long time was up against the cage, getting sort of mauled and dominated. And I know that's even something that we've talked about. But, um, you know, I think leading into the Dana White Contender Series, that was something he started to shore up. But I think at the same time, letting Anjikwani, you know, dictate as he moves in and out with his strikes, the power's there. But it's all about the precision with the power. The, the man knows how to plan a strike exactly where it needs to be. Um, he's going to have to make it ugly, Rodriguez is. And I think that, you know, Rodriguez as a dog isn't a bad shot, but this is so tightly lined. I mean, I just don't know, man. I think that if these guys fought 10 times, it, it's a pretty decent uh, line. And I was, I don't know what line I was thinking about. I thought it was starting to get away from it. But um, it seems like almost every podcast is sort of, at least that I've, I've listened to anyways, is sort of talking about um, Chidi Anjikawani. But regardless, um, what's your take on this one? I, I think this is more of a stay off for me. I can see it going both ways. And I know that's sort of a, I mean, Rodriguez by submission on the ground, maybe possibly TKO on the ground is a possible play, but I'm sort of on the fence with this one. Both guys have shown to be really great as of late, but at points also poor fight IQ and, and some issues. So, where do you stand with this one? Uh, in one, it's pretty hard to uh, to break down. Yeah. So from a betting perspective, like this fight for me is violence all day. Um, mm -hmm. I just I don't. So here's where we're at, right? It's like you fade poor fight IQ. It's something I live by whenever it comes to betting on fights. And unfortunately, both, both these guys have dog shit fight IQ, and that's where I get stuck on this, right? Because Gregory Rodriguez has a black belt. Chitty regional scene, you see it struggles with takedowns. Wears them down. The guy's gas tank issues. But my thing is, Gregory Rodriguez doesn't choose to wrestle. Like, he doesn't choose to use his black belt. 
where he's going to have a clear advantage in this fight. So it's like, are you going to... Let's think back, right? So we think back to last week. Me, everybody, and their fucking mother is on the fact that Norma's going to take down Wolf there and smash her. And she chooses to strike with her. Don't get me wrong. She won that fight. But she literally gave her only win condition to her opponent to prove a point. I will say, I will say one thing, though, about her, though. And I know, I know I'm sidetracking on this. She did go for the takedown the moment that she felt a little bit of pushback from Danielle, but Danielle seemed to just sort of break. But still, so fuck yes, my ticket. She, should, <laughs> she shouldn't let her ego get in the way. She should have went right for the win condition. And I am with you on that. Yeah, so that's the thing. It's like you know, you want to bet on fighters who are going to fight for your money, but you also want to bet on fighters who are going to go out of their way to win their fight. And I worry because I am on the Gregory Rodriguez side, but I just like to me, violence is the answer because. If he chooses to strike with Chitty, he's probably going to get knocked out because he has that like standard hands down, wants to throw bombs. But Chitty's just a much better kickboxer, and he's going to be able to capitalize on, on that for sure. We've seen Robocop rocked multiple times. So What's the line currently sitting at? For uh, Robocop? No, for uh, the play. Uh, right now, the violence play is sitting at just give me two seconds here. Uh, the under 1.5 is sitting at my uh, plus 105, but um, where the fuck is it here? Yeah, minus 250 for the fight doesn't go the distance. I think okay, it's the so maybe close to the fight day. That'll probably get juice though, but I mean, I like I would like the under two and a half, but those lines don't usually drop till right before fight time. Um, yeah, it's just yeah, man, you can't you can't bank on either one of these guys to fight a perfect game plan. So I said I think you bet violence and you see which one of them drops the best way to fight it. but from a pick i'll take gregory rodriguez just because i what i see from chitty prior to his last three fights makes me concerned against a guy who's just as i said hands down gonna make him work like he's not even if they said this fight will probably take place striking but i don't know I, it's just, it's hard if chitty wins i'll be happy because i'm rooting for chitty but my funny violence yeah so i'm not the only one that's sort of all over the place on that one I mean, the way the line's going up and down, they've both been favorites and underdogs all throughout the week. Nobody knows what the fuck to do with this fight. Might have been one of those fights that if you watched the line and gone on both sides of it and were smart with it, it might have been the play, right? That's it. Next fight on the card, we have Andre Feely against Bill Algeo. Um, I'm going to let you take this one away. Andre Feely coming in at 29-9-0 against the 16-6-0 Bill Algeo. So Andre Feely, um, you know, the striking... Pretty much, it's a lower, lower, a little bit lower volume, but I, I mean, really, it's going to be an interesting breakdown for this one. I'm going to pass this one off to you. See exactly where you take this one, and uh, yeah, man, I, I'm sort of this is more of a stay off for me. But uh, what's your take? I personally like Andre Feely a lot in this fight, man. I think with Bill Algio, we saw so you go in the Herbert Burns fight, right? We all knew what was going to happen. Herbert Burns has a legendary gas tank of about 35 seconds, so. And with him blowing out his knee in that fight, it really didn't make his life any better. I'm surprised he even got up to go into the second round. Um, his fight with Jordan Zabrito, you know, it was it was a very smart game plan. Like, he was able to fight past his condition because Burrito came out there throwing bombs. And unfortunately for Burrito, he just wasn't able to connect and Bill Algio was able to capitalize. But when you look at Andre Feely, like, Algio isn't coming out here KOing people or giving people a lot of problems. And I kind of favor uh, Feely in every aspect of this fight. I think he's got the better wrestling. I think he's got the better grappling. And I think he kind of just puts everything together a lot better. So this fight right now, Andre Feely sitting at about a minus 130 with the return on Algeo being a plus 110. It's going to be a very close contested fight. Um, I said, I think Andre Feely would be able to do enough to ride it out to a decision. But I think if you want to take the safest bet on this fight, you're going to bet the fact that the fight goes to the decision. I think it'll be very closely contested over three rounds. What do you think about this one? Yeah, I mean, I know that we talked pre-fight because I didn't get the tape too much on this one. But, I mean, if you're looking at, I think the winning factor um, would be the mix-in of strikes and takedowns um, from Feely. Feely's averaging about two and a half takedowns per fight. Um, and I think if he can get just a little bit more control time um, and really hold him in place and just land some shots and – basically just like you said get to a decision i think that is the path to victory really um doesn't want to really keep it on the feet without joe because 
he'll just sort of make it look a little bit sloppy for the judges land land more volume he lands about um almost six strikes to absorbing about four strikes so really when it comes down to it i think i'll, I'll go with the wrestling on the side of this one but i mean feely being the vet i know will will likely realize he's gonna have to be active and just uh land as much as possible even maybe uh, attempt a couple of submissions to score some points for the judges. But uh, yeah, the over definitely could be a play on this one. Um, but really another for one for me, it's going to be management on this one, likely a stay off, but I, I don't mind the fight goes to the decision. What did you say it was? Minus 250 right now. Okay. And then the over one and a half. Is... Or, or, or I guess that won't be up. Sorry. It'll be over two and a half right now. Yeah. Which is sitting at minus 200. So it's kind of the same value per se. <laughs> Yeah, 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 that makes sense. Okay, the next fight on the card, and because I took sort of the lead on the last two, I'm going to let you take the lead on this one. This one's a pretty easy one to break down, I think. I don't know what they're doing with Dan Badovsky. Um, Poor guy. Dana White really likes Joe Pfeiffer. He, he really wants you to be like him, and he really, really likes him coming in at 9-2-0 against Alan Badovsky, 8-3-0. I know there is some talent there, but man, he's been just starched recently too many times. And this and Joe Pfeiffer's just high pressure, just a fucking Viking of a man. Um, pretty scary. What do you think on this one? How do you think it plays out? Uh, and what are the odds currently sitting at? Yeah, well, the odds right now, this is uh, right now, Joe Pfeiffer's the biggest favorite on the card. Wow. Sitting at a minus 425 favorite with their turn on Alan Adamadowski at plus 340. Um, I said, man, like the Joe Pye for love, man. It's like it's warning, man. The guy's got crazy grappling, great striking. Um, but like, I don't know. Like, I'm not warning the fact that this guy just shot in this fight. The guy lost to fucking John Phillips of all people. But you know, like it's yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, this guy, like, this is literally the biggest setup fight in the world, which makes me scared to touch it. Because generally, whenever you see just these whacked out lines where they're just like gimme fights, you always see problems. But, you know, as you were saying, man, there's not much to break down here. Joe Piper has an advantage in every single aspect of this fight. The fact that Allen's still in the UFC is mind boggling. I don't um, hate, and I think it's around even. I don't hate Joe Piper by KO. Um, that's nah, minus 200, I mean, man. Is it minus two hundred now? Oh my god! I haven't yeah, like it is so it blow up. Just got starts then. Like if anything, if you want to get some value on it, I don't hate the over one point five. I'm assuming Joe Piper gets him out of there, but he's, it might be more of a grindy way to it. Like we talk a lot of shit in Alan Amadowski, but he's still in the UFC. He still is a UFC fighter. You have to assume that he's here for a reason. So I don't hate the fact that it's an over because Joe Pfeiffer isn't necessarily notoriously known for getting people out there. He generally gets people out of there in the second round, the third round. So if you're looking for plus money this way, if you're just looking for a parlay piece, violence is definitely the answer. Okay, so we are now four fights into this and... I have one play that I'm looking at, and it's actually the main event, which is very odd because usually that is not the case. Um, so we will move into the next fight on the card. We have Tanner Bozer, 28 and 1 against Rodrigo Nascimento, 9 1 and 0. Oh. Nascimento coming off a juicy layoff. Tanner Bozer, a game opponent. What are the odds currently sitting at right now? And I'll let you take this one away. Um, sorry, now it's pulling it up. Um, yeah, so right now Tanner Bowes are sitting at minus 165 favorite with the return on Rodrigo being a plus 140. I think this fight's greasy, man. Like, I got to be honest. Like, you're talking about all these fights you're off on. I like props on the other fights, like over-unders. This one I'm scared to touch, man. Like, as a Canadian, like, I really want to see Tanner Bowes or win. But Rodrigo being 8-1, and one, the dude's a motherfucker, too. Like, he had that loss to Chris Dawkins. But I, you know my thing with Tanner Bowser, right? Tanner Bowser has looked like dog shit off his back when he gets put there. That's exactly where Rodrigo is going to want to put him. So I'm going to side with the underdog of this one. I'm going to fade my Canadian brother on this one. Just because as much as I think he'll be able to come out here swinging, I think he's going to expose himself and have his ass put on the ground. That being said, and I do have prior commitments that day, but if I am around whenever this fight is taking place, 
if this fight extends past the round and then uh, Tanner Bowser is able to survive, I will trust Tanner Bowser's cardio any day over Rodrigo. So I'm going to go with Rodrigo as my pick. I'm going to go with Rodrigo by submission. But if Tanner Bowser can get past that early onslaught of wild hooks and takedowns, I think Tanner Bowser can come back in the second or third. And I, I think this is a good live betting spot. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, he is a monster, and if he grounds it, Nascimento could come out and look like a, a huge favorite. Bowser always, always has been game, and this is yet another one that, that could be a stay off. Violence definitely could be play the play. Bowser are pretty, pretty defensively sound when it comes to his striking. He's landing four strikes per minute and absorbing about two. Um, Nascimento, not the same. He likes chaos. He's landing about five and absorbing about six. Um, if, those are, if Bozer can really keep a high guard and keep this smart, definitely could try to push the pace, get to a little bit of a gassy Nascimento um, scrambling, maybe win a decision, but even violence could be a spot. And I was, like, I was asking you earlier, what is, what is the actual violence spot on this? What's the, the value on it? The violent spot right now is sitting at, just give me a sec here. The violent spot right now is sitting, well, the under 1.5 is sitting at plus 105. And so minus 280 on the fight doesn't go to decision. Mm, okay. <clears throat> Maybe another fight I stay off of, um, more so because of Rodrigo's layoff. Um, and really, Bozer is just a, a guy who's always game. So definitely an interesting one. Next fight in the card, we have Anthony Hernandez against Mark Andre Barrio. Um, obviously, another Canadian on the card. Mark Andre Barrio, the power bar, um, is a guy who, you know, has shown good grappling at times. More, more so on the regional scene when he was uh, challenged there, um, up against the cage, defensive grappling to get it out in, in range where he wants it. He wants to be able to tag you up and touch you up. Um, Mark Andre Barrio, 14 5 0 against Anthony Fluffy Hernandez, 9 2 0. Hernandez um, was brought to fame off of his submission um, over pretty much gassing out um, Vera and then submitting him, you know. And then in his last fight against Fremd, he just put on a fucking pace on the guy. Um, and I can't remember who it is who compares him to Cain Velasquez, but it, it is sort of a similar style, man. He mixes up the strikes really well. Well, um, and then just gets on those hips and smashes you to the mat and is able to push the pace. So you're just basically left, like always trying to be defensive, always trying to scramble and figure out what's going on. But that being said, a good way to stop pace and a good way to stop pressure is to get punched in the face by Barrio with the power. Um, this is definitely an interesting one. I don't think that Barrio is quite um, out to lunch as everybody thinks. Yeah, he beats Jordan Wright in his last fight, fine, but he gets starched by Andrew Kawani. Um, everybody's still wondering if his chin's quite there. Um, man, I, I really like this fight, but it, it's definitely a hard one to pick because I think Fernandez could push the pace on him, but I think that Barrio uh, touching him up is is definitely live. What is the line currently sitting at um, right now for Hernandez and Barrio? Um, the line right now is sitting uh, at minus 175 for Hernandez with the return on Mark Barrio being a plus 150. Okay. So, yeah, man, I don't know. It, it, for you, what's your sort of take on this one? How do you sort of see this playing out? Yeah, so, see, this once again, like, as you said, like, this is a really tough card, right? So, I favor Anthony Hernandez. I think his leg kicks and his kind of complex level of striking will be the difference in this. But I see that Barrio is going to be able to win minutes, and that's what worries me in the spot. Because with Barrio... If you watch, like, you know, his last two fights were kind of odd. Yeah, the Jordan Wright fight where he got a submission where nobody in the world would assume that. And then you had um, the Chitty fight where he just got clipped once. And you know what it is, man? Like, this is fighting. Like, people get clipped, and if they get clipped in the right spot, they're going to go to sleep. Chitty's a high-level kickboxer. Can't take that away from him. But if you watch his fights prior to his last two, he's very good at nullifying people's offense. Like, if he gets people up against the cage... He's able to work in those minutes, kind of go for the grindy takedowns and kind of work a dirty boxing-esque type of game and wear on his opponent. So I think this fight's close. Um, I think this fight goes to decision, which is the way I would honestly look at betting it. Because as I said, I feel like both guys, like they're not necessarily like the finishing type fighters. Like if you look at Hernandez, like his fight 
against the Rafael de uh, Rafael Vieira. Like he got mauled in the first round. Like he only won that fight because Vera Vieira had nothing left to give. Like that dude was a walking gas tank and there was nothing inside of it. So it's just such a high variance fight. They're giving us a special this week where you got 14 fights on this card. And this is one where I'd stay far away from from a betting perspective. Yeah, man, if it goes to the judges' scorecards, you could have burial winning moments, like you were saying, where he's got big power shots, where he's sort of rocking Hernandez at moments. And then Monez, uh, Hernandez is always game. He's going to keep pressuring, uh, maybe land a takedown or two, or have some control time mixed up with a lot of volume and striking. And you just don't know how that would be judged. It's definitely a hard one. And uh, maybe even if, if you want to be a degenerate, you look at a, a split decision on that one. Um, if you think it goes to decision, that maybe not a, a bad look if you want to take a, a shot at that. Because And I wasn't even thinking about decision, but after your breakdown, that really does fully make sense. But for me, I, I can see both guys once again. I know I'm sort of flip-flop on this, but that's the kind of card this really is. Barrio definitely could catch him with some power shots. Maybe put him out. Maybe win the decision. Hernandez could definitely um, push the pace on him, push the gas tank on him and win the decision too. I just don't know. Um, yeah, and also they're plus money with the value, and then you're gonna have to go with value on somebody if you want to. You could go with the, the dog on on some of these, but what were you saying? The the fight goes to decision sitting at plus one twenty, so you're getting plus money on it too. You know what? I don't mind that play, and I think that might be a play on the card. We're looking for sharp angles. I think that might be a good one because everybody's expecting this to finish, and I think that the finishing side might come more on the Barrio side. And Hernandez is, I don't want to say it, but I will. You can't, you can't. Fuck with the Mexicans, man. They don't they don't go to sleep. They they fight the warriors. I don't know what it is. Um, it just literally is a thing. And it, it comes from a long line of Mexican boxers. They they are warriors and they they don't go away. So um I really like that play actually. I think that's gonna be a play on the night. All right, next one on the card, we have Damon Jackson against Pat Sabatini. Uh Damon Jackson coming in at 21, 4 and 1 against Pat Sabatini's um 17, 3 and 0. Um Right now, the line currently, we have Sabatini, a minus 190 favorite against, I don't know who I would argue is more of a seasoned vet and Damon Jackson at plus 155. I get the love on Sabatini. I do get it. In fact, Sabatini's fight was one of the ones that sort of started this all. Um, You know, when Jamal Emmer shows poor fight IQ and doesn't try to keep the fight standing, um, using his knees and clinch work, Sabatini takes him down and is, it, this sort of starts things for him. And you see him go on a little bit of a run. Um, he beats uh, Lutz, he beats uh, TJ Laramie. Um, the one thing about that Laramie fight though, and it's no shot against Laramie because Laramie, with Laramie, he was undersized in that fight. And although I think that Sabatini really is a solid, solid grappler, I just don't really get the line right now because I don't think Pat Sabatini is a great striker. He's a good striker. He's got some good, good stand up. But I don't really see him having crazy moments with Damon Jackson on the feet. Damon Jackson is a dog. And although the one thing I would say is Damon Jackson, really, I don't know if he's coming off a win or not. Uh, against Arjueta, I would argue he lost that fight. You know, there were there were some arguments on that. And uh, so I'm definitely on that. And I was on the side of Damon Jackson in that fight. I remember, like, going, almost ripping up my ticket beforehand and and realizing, bang, uh, we, were, we were we're good to go. So, um yeah, man, I just don't know. I think that there's any grappling going on here and who's going to really impose their will. And I think Damon Jackson, some time and time again, in ugly, crazy fights, he he does. And he actually is pretty active with his strikes as well, too, when he's on the ground. So I just don't know why the line is so wide. And I think for me, this is just a play I got to make and I got to go Damon Jackson on this one. I, I think that it's not even that I'm trying to fade Pat Sabatini because I've sort of jumped off that train. I think it's a bad guy to fade. But if you're going to give me Damon Jackson at plus 155 with the win condition that he wants, like he's going to be working in that realm. I just, I could see him winning top control um, moments for, for a period of time and Sabatini trying to dig for legs. And I think Jackson's going to be able to get out of that situation and scramble. And I, I, I don't know, man, I think that Jackson's going to be able to even actually try to submit Sabatini himself. I don't think he's going to be able to get that. I like Damon Jackson by submission, but I like, or by decision, sorry. Um, but uh, money line at plus 155, I'll take the dog shot on Damon Jackson, man. I just think it's going to be a grappling match. And, um, man, these guys are too tight just because of the age. I think that's bullshit. So, your take. Yeah, man, like I said, I have a agreement. To me, Damon Jackson is my dog of the night on this one, man. Just primarily because, like, Pat Sabatini is good, but he's very stationary when he fights. Like, his striking to me is very mediocre. 
And what do we see time and time again? You have two fighters who primarily want to grapple. Well, who's going to be the better striker? And that's a very important factor. Because even if you look at Damon Jackson, man, like his scrambles are on point. Like he's not going to give Pat Sabatini a minute. He's almost doubling him on strikes landed per minute if this stays on the fight. Takedowns landed per minute. Or uh, take down landed per 15. He's only uh Pat Sabatini's only landing one more, and that's because he primarily relies on it. So if you look at strikes to Zor per minute, Damon Jackson's landing or again having more strikes landed per minute, but it's also because he's the one that kind of wants to engage in these affairs here. So I think Damon Jackson's just gonna be able to weather the storm here. I think Pat Sabatini will probably come out strong. But I think as this fight progresses, Damon Jackson is going to heavily take over. And I agree with you. I think it's going to be a decision victory for him. I think people put a lot of stock in Pat Sabatini over his uh, win over against Emmers. And as you said, the Laramie win. Laramie, he's too big and bulky for the division, man. He's so undersized. So I uh, I like Damon Jackson in the spot a lot, man. And I think he's able to ride this out to a decision. Yeah, I think Sabatini is going to be making things look clean, you know, and, and I think that on the flip side, we have Jackson who's going to make him chaos, you know, even the grappling realm and on the feet as well, too. He likes to be in wars and, and you know, has had some split wins and close judges where you're like, oh, wh- where is this going? Where is this going? Because he's in those battles. So I'm, I'm going to take it, man. I'm going to take the dog money on this one, Damon Jackson, 100 motherfucking percent. <laughs> Next fight on the card we have. Aspen Ladd, who likes to get jabbed um, against Sarah McMahon, who really is somebody who has quite never sort of lived up to what she potentially could have with the pedigree wrestling that she is. So we have Aspen Ladd coming in at 9-3-0 and against Sarah McMahon at 13-6-0. And, um, and right now the line currently is sitting at... Where are we? Aspen Ladd at minus 140 and Sarah McMahon at dog money just slightly at plus 115. What's your take on this one? Are we going to go with poor fight IQ um, on either side of this? Because they've shown it. Cardio issues on one end potentially of uh, McMahon and age if you want to look at it. But I don't know if she showed age against uh, Carol Hosa in her last fight. So we shall see. What's your take on this one, brother? Take it away. I'm heavily on Sarah McMahon this one, man. I think she easily wins two out of three rounds. And I think, like, if you're going to bet Aspen Lab, man, I think that third round TKO, I feel like a lot of people who do this type of stuff are promoting it. But it's because it's what we know with Sarah McMahon, right? You go for win conditions. But I'd be fucking astonished if Aspen Lab wins the first round or the second round. I think Sarah McMahon's going to be able to take her down. I think it's going to be a boring fight, and she's going to be able to hold her there. And just put pressure on her. And I think Aspen Lad's gonna be frustrated. And I think she probably survives the third round and rides out like a 29-28 decision. I'll probably sprinkle Aspen Lad third round TKO because Sir McMahon's gas tank issues are very well known throughout the MMA betting community. And it's something we all kind of, you know, you gotta, gotta have caution on it. She's an amazing grappler, but she's not one to put you out. So whenever those grappling exchanges start to get too much, she's 42 years old. Things get a little dicey, you know. Cardio doesn't always hold up, but I think Sarah McMahon rides us out to a fairly easy decision. Yeah, I mean, I think that she is another example of somebody who has a, a strong win condition. Maybe it isn't as strong in this fight particularly, but um, and she's fallen in love with her striking, and her striking is shown to be not very good. She sort of sits and waits for her power shot and ends up getting clipped more than she throws and lands, um, and she just sort of gets caught. And for me. Wrestling's going to be her condition. And I think that in the stand-up right now with what we saw out of um, McMahon and then the Hosa fight, I'm really interested to see how this plays out. I, I think if it does go later, um, obviously we, we have a potential for Lad to, to start taking, pulling away and, and figuring out a way to get the victory in this fight. But I just really see um, a wrestle-heavy talk game from McMahon. Um, she lands, like, what, 4.38 takedowns per fight. Um, and the takedown defense on Lad, she's got 62% of takedown defense, but I mean, this is pedigrees and levels here, man. I think she's going to be on her ass, on her back, um, likely getting elbows, uh, with a shoulder in her chest and, uh, either loses a decision or 
man, I, McMahon can get her out of there. I, I just think we've seen we've seen Lad sort of give up in multiple ways and in, in weight cuts. And yes, I don't cut weight. I don't know what it's about. Um, and in fights, you know, mentally just check out. And I think that we'll see that here uh, when she's not winning in her condition. So I'm definitely on the McMahon side of this. Uh, I think everybody's on the McMahon side of this. And I think that that's why the dog is now likely going to be the favorite or at pick him by the time this goes to fight night. Next fight on the card, we have Damon, or sorry, we have Trevin Giles against Luis Koski. Um, is it Koski or, or Kosi? How do you? Kosi. Kosi. I'm, I'm asking you for pronunciations. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Jonathan has something to say about that one. There are times. Okay, so Trevin Giles and Kosi, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I didn't take this one too much because I really would, don't want to talk too much on this one for one reason. I don't think anybody should touch us with a 10 foot pole. Um, really Kosi has some power in his hands. And I always say that when I don't know too much about people and they do have the power, cause that's all I can uh, sort of lean on. Um, th this is more about Trevin Giles, a guy who you just sort of have to not trust. You just don't know what you're going to get from him. He has definite power in his hands and some solid striking, but just doesn't really, I, I don't know if he believes in it or not, but he just showed poor fight, fight IQ time and time again. Um, he's coming off of a two-fight losing streak. Trevin Giles, 14-4-0 against Louis Kosi, 17-1-0. I'm going to more lay off this one. I'm not going to try to, to say any bullshit or, or make up any bullshit on this one. I'm going to leave, leave this one to you. Um, really looking at it, I just don't see an angle on this. I just more of a stay off for me. What's your take and what's the line sitting at? So right now the line is sitting at... Uh, minus 210 for Trevor Giles with the turn on Lewis Cossey at plus 180. This is the definition of a dog or pass situation, though. Because, like, you can't bet Trevor Giles because he's got the worst fight IQ I've ever seen in my life. And Lewis Cossey, he was a minus 600 against Pla against Sasha Plavkinov <laughs> and somehow dropped the ball in that fight. Like... The thing with Kosi, though, is if you're going to bet Kosi, it's a first round or bust, man. Like, the guy's got good grappling and hell of a strong hand. But if he doesn't get you out of there, you are in danger because his gassing falls off a cliff real quick. So, I got no action on this fight, man. I don't like Ben Trevor Giles because I said I don't like his fight IQ. He's kind of screwed me around time and time again. And with Kosi, it's just you haven't seen too much. Because he came in off the contender series as a giant favorite. And we haven't really been able to put it together since of where he's at. We haven't seen the guy in a couple of years. Um, let me say this before I stand corrected on this. But I believe his last fight. Yeah, his last fight was in uh, 2020. So we haven't seen him in quite some time. Apparently, he's been working real hard on his cardio. Trying to get himself back on track. So I'm going to side with the dog on this one. It's just because Trevin Giles has been chinny in the past and we know Kosi is going to come out first and I'm going to go a little ballsy on this and just go to his only win condition and say Kosi gets him out of there in the first round by KO at plus 900. Okay. I mean, no, I get it. I, it's, it, it is sort of the degenerate prop play, but it is with a little bit of finding the angle. I mean, if you're going to go at it, it's more of a fade of Giles, right? And I, I, I definitely could see it. Um, and, and you gotta get just, a couple just of to back points. this up, right? Like, so we talked about Brito a lot on this fight card, and I said, although he's not fighting on this, whenever he fought Andre Feely, you and I obviously were still doing the podcast back then. And I said, exactly, I said, I'm not gonna bet this fight because Feely is a big favorite, and I don't really agree with the line. And we're going exactly right back to that point here is, but Brito by KO first round is plus 1100. And I'm like, I'm just gonna bet the one guy's win condition that's the underdog, and I'm gonna let it be. Mm -hmm. If I lose 10 bucks on this, I lose 10 bucks. If I win, I'm making 110 bucks off a $10 bet. And that's kind yeah, of what you got to do in these sketchy spots, you know? If you even want to bet them, there and find them, I like it. Yeah, bet the win condition and fucking leave it alone. Okay, next fight on the card. Bet the win condition and leave it the fuck alone. You heard it here first. <laughs> Okay, so next one on the card, we have Denise Gomes against Loma Lukumi. Um, So we know that Diana Balbita was uh, set to fight and had to pull out. Denise Gomes comes in on short notice, just fought on the Dana White Contender Series. 
Um, six one and zero oh for Gomes and Luke Boomy coming in with a you know a lot lot more of a I would say strength of schedule at least. Most of her her fights have been in the UFC. She's six three and zero. But if we're looking at it, you know, I'm watching tape on this, and I, I did a little bit more tape study actually on the first couple fights, the fights where you find a little bit more about, it's a little harder to find a win condition. Sometimes we can look at um, some of the fights that are higher up on the card and sort of know where they might play out. Um, these ones are going to try to dig in and see. With So with Denise Gomes, you obviously saw in her Dana White Contender Series, she, she pressures forward, man. Solid striking. Um, you know, she does have the spinning wheel kick. She was throwing out maybe a little bit too much. Um but when it comes down to it, she's always pressuring, always pressuring. The only thing about that is it might play into Loma Lukbumi's hands, who is a counter striker, who's, who's got, you know, quite a bit of pop and power in her hands. But she still has pretty decent volume for a counter striker. She, she's still landing about 4.4 strikes per minute. But even in her last fight, if we're just going to go off the one fight sample size, if we're, if we're looking at stats, Gomes through 6.8. Um, so with that, or Gomes, I think is how it's pronounced. That so... Um, with that, man, this is definitely an interesting fight to, to see. I mean, if you're looking at it, um, maybe just look at the dog shot of this one. I, I got to be honest with you. I think that I could see Luke Bumi tagging her. I could see her countering her with some hooks on the way in. But I think the pressure right now, I'm, I'm going to go with the dog shot in this one, man. She's sitting at plus 190 right now. I'm going to take a shot on uh, Denise Gomez because um, I just think that she's going to be able to stay at least out of trouble a little bit. But I wouldn't be surprised if someone with the strength of schedule is a little more, I guess, a seasoned vet, so to speak, with with Loma, who may catch her on the way in. But definitely take a shot on the dog. What's your thought? Um, complete opposite end. And only mm-hmm. because <laughs> – so with Loma, she's undersized in every single fight she has. Like, she's a natural atom weight. And we'll say this every single time we talk about her, and so will every single capper and podcaster that addresses Loma. She's a natural atom weight. UFC doesn't want to implement the 105 division. We get it. So she's generally undersized. She's not in this fight. Like, she's only has a two-inch uh, height difference and only a two-inch reach difference. So she's actually going to be able to connect. If you look at Loma's fights where she loses, she's a very talented striker. She just can't hit her target because they're generally two times the size of her because she's fighting at a weight class that she doesn't belong at. So I think in this instance – where she'll actually be able to close the range with pretty e- uh, pretty much an easy target, per se, I think she'll be able to land the better strikes. And I think she'll be able to definitely ride this one out. But I don't hate I don't anybody, man. Gonna, I don't think she's going to have an issue with closing range because – because uh, Denise is going to bring it right to her. And like I was pretty much in the breakdown that I saw, I was saying, um, I could definitely see Luke Bumi catching her, right? She's playing right into her. She can catch her with counters on the way in uh, nonstop. It's just more of a value play for me. And I thought, why not? Women's MMA, take the plus 190 shot in the dog. Um, I don't hate it, man. Um, it's going to probably go to the decision. Like, They're both uh, like really Parker, good strikers. So. I'm with you on the, the breakdown. Should be a fun one to watch. I was even looking at fight doesn't go the distance, but it's not, likely not uh, a play. So. Next fight on the card, we have Trey Ogden against Daniel Zellhuber. Um, it's Trey Ogden coming in at 15-5-0 and against Daniel Zellhuber coming in at 14-0-0, uh, and undefeated so far. Um, one of the Dana White Contender Series over Lucas Almeida. That obviously is, a, you know, actually standing up pretty nicely. Lucas Almeida won his big war against Mike Trezano um, and, you know, won the hearts of a lot of people. What a war that was. Um so he's actually fought since Zellhuber beat him on the Daniel Contender Series already. But if we're looking at it, Zellhuber's got some solid-ass stand-up. And one second. If we look at the line, we have Zellhuber coming in at minus 300 against the plus 240 um, Ogden. And, I mean, I don't like the line at all. But I think that Ogden's stand-up is – he leaves himself exposed way too much. I think that the confusion from Zellweber out of both stances with – it's not really a karate style, but he'll, he'll do like more of a kickboxing style at range. Um, he's going to be able to just mix it up. And I think that the one thing I did notice is that uh, Ogden's body is open nonstop all the time. And if that left kick is there, that left kick from Selpaw, I think Zellweber's going to find a place for it and work that body – Pretty regularly. Obviously, we're going to want to see Ogden's going to want to try to get this scrambly to the and get this to the ground somehow um, and try to work for um, a submission. I think there's actually even a reach advantage there for Zellweber. I think what, what are we looking at? Yeah, it's it's a what five inch reach advantage. Um, so maybe even the length actually helps him with submission defense. I don't know. 
Um, but yeah, obviously Zellweger's the side, but I mean, at minus 300, it's sort of unplayable there. You're going to have to dig for props. Um, one thing I was looking at was maybe by KO, it's a plus 175, but really, I don't even have a bet on this one, man. I think that, uh, you know, Zellweger comes off the Daniel Henry series, looks good, but he's got to prove it. And I think that uh, right now, I just, I, I want to sort of, I want him to show it and I want to see him in, under the bigger, bigger lights and see what goes on. So. I will stay off this one, but my side is Zell Huber. And if you want to look at it, plus 175 by KO, eh, I don't mind it, but I'm going to stay off it myself. Yeah, I think this really showed me spot. Like Trey Ogden literally got outstruck by um, everybody. The janitor. Everybody. By, <laughs> who's the guy that Patty just fought? I can't believe I'm drawing a blank here. Jordan Lovett. Jordan Lovett. He literally yeah, got Levitt, outstruck. Lovett sort of made it look like he was a striker in that fight. Yeah, and Jordan Levitt is the farthest thing from a striker. Um, He's a backpack. Yeah, like, back, once again, back, this, back, that's back. it. Like, this is a show-me spot. Like, you broke it down perfectly, man. There's not really much else to say. Like, Ogden's going to get outstruck. He's going to get outpointed. And at some point in time, he's probably going to get KO'd. So, that's that, man. I really can't add more than what you added. Um, there's a reason why he's a minus 305 favorite. They're kind of just trying to get the first win in the UFC under the belt. So that some people know who he is, and then we'll see what they bring to him next. But if he doesn't ride in the spot, I'd be very surprised. Agreed. Next fight in the car, we have Maria Agapova against Julian Robertson. Agapova 10 3 0 against Julian Robertson 10 7 0. Um, some fight IQ issues on both sides of the fence on this one. Um, more not the shit on Julian Robertson because I am a fan of hers, but it's just her winning condition is very sound, right? It, it's a, a submission. It's a takedown to the ground. She said recently she wants to win by TKO on the ground. I'm okay with that. As long as you get it to the ground and you're close to your win condition, I'm happy with that. Um, but the one I really got to fade in this one, man, and I'll, I'll pass it off to you and I'll give my take in a minute, would be the lady of the the hour sometimes is Agapova. She is just so much chaos and with chaos comes instability and inconsistency. And I think that that's the best way to describe her. Um, but right now, currently the line is sitting at a gop of a light, uh, you know, and, and I agree at plus plus one twenty five against Robertson's favorite at minus one fifty. I sort of like that. So what's your take on this book? I like Jillian a lot, man. I think a gop of a, I think she gets taken out fairly easily. Her take down events is shit. I know our boy John's going to be listening here and you're going to lose, bud. A bot, a I can't even say this girl's name. So you're gonna make fun of me for this. She's not gonna win this fight. You can't you talk shit to the man if you can't say the girl's name. I'm just I know, but that see, see, that's where it gets you, man, because he's big on the women's MMA, and I just like Agapova. Agapova. All right, she's gonna lose. She can get taken down. She can get subbed probably in the second round. You know, we all jumped on the hype train. We tried. We tried, but I jumped off that train real quick. Man, I, I got her by submission. I got her by club and sub, man. I, you know, I, I jumped on that train, but her last fight, she just looked horrible. Like, it, it just doesn't really work. No, I, I follow her on Instagram. I just don't even get it. I'm just going to leave it there. Like, I think Jillian's going to take her down, and I think she's going to submit her yeah. ass real quick. So, Jonathan, you're going to lose this one, bud. Yeah, sorry, bro. It's not happening for you. It's not happening for you, lady. Um, and if we're looking at it, uh, what are the lines currently sitting at as far as any props? What do we got? Julian, Julian by submission, I think is plus two, plus two fifty five. I'll take that. Fight doesn't go is minus minus one eighty five. I think they're sort of expecting that it's a slight juicy, um, but maybe under under two and a half. The line right now they have an under one and a half. I think that's there available, um, but <laughs> under two and a half maybe a play as well too. This fight isn't going the distance. I can't see it. Um, and if it does, I think it's a Robertson victory by just laying on top of her chest and, and smashing her with, with some short shots. Um, definitely on the side of Robertson. And I like the money line, man. I think that's the play, really, if you want to just be straight up. Minus 150, be nice and clean. But I could see her submitting a Agapova because Agapova has no submission defense, John. Yeah, because like you're only, at least on DraftKings right now, you're only getting plus 150 on Robertson by submission. To me, that's not a lot of value. Like, you're paying just above plus money prices on women's MMA to finish inside the distance. Like, there's a good chance that this is going to go 15 minutes. Like, I, I agree with you. I don't think it will. But if... Okay, right now, go to Bodog, plus 255, Julian Roberts by submission. Oh, smash that. You're getting such a better line than I'm getting here. Yeah. 
Um, maybe it's their, their, you know, I don't know. But yeah, I jump on that line. That line's still there. I just want to double check to make sure I didn't see that wrong. Maybe it was uh, another another uh, number. But yeah, plus 255 jillion by submission. I like it. Um, and I got to sprinkle it. But I even like their money line. I, you know, I'm not going to necessarily parlay it up because we've seen some lapses on both sides in the past. But I just see that it's just very distinct. Weak takedown defense of Agapava. And uh, she's going to get submitted by maybe, you know, maybe even a Kimura behind her back, Johnny. Anyways, <laughs> we'll stop talking shit to that man because uh, he's awesome. But we will move forward into the next fight. And uh, very interested in what your take on this one is. I'm actually going to let you take it away. Uh, I take this one pretty extensively. Um, we have Tony Gravely against Javid Basharat. And we had his brother, who I had inside the distance yesterday, not quite do that, but still look pretty solid and dominant. Um so we have Gravely coming in, a guy who a little, quite a bit more active than than Javid, and uh, Gravely's twenty three seven and no, not been in the UFC for necessarily that long, but fought quite a bit of fights in the UFC um, against the twelve zero and zero Javid Basharat. We know where the win conditions are. Um, the line currently is sitting at plus. 136 for Gravely against, and I know people go back and forth on Gravely, Gravely. I'm going to fucking say Gravely. Um, against the favored uh, Javid in minus 170. What's your take on this one, man? There's a little bit of hype coming in on Javid, and I don't know if the line is exactly where it's supposed to be. I think this should be tighter at least. But what's your take on this one? I think it should be like a minus 125 maybe or flipped. But anyway. Yeah, like I can see where people have their concerns with Javid on this one, but I think he rides in the spot, man. Like I think, as I mentioned in the fight prior, like this is more of a show me spot for him. The thing with Gravely is like Gravely is a great fighter, but he's a gatekeeper in my opinion. Like he kind of only wins the fights he's supposed to win, and I think against Javid, like he's just so well rounded. Like even if you look at his brother the other night or last night, sorry, like. He was able just to deflect the takedowns, like take down his opponent in his own will. Like, they're very, very well-rounded fighters, and they're very cool and complex. And my favorite thing about Javid is he doesn't chase the finish. And, you know, from a betting perspective, like people are like, oh, like that's worrisome, but it's not. Like he is so calculated in the fact of what he has to do in a fight where he's capable of going to the decision. He's capable of going to the K- or getting the KO. And he's capable of getting uh, the submission. If you look at the props on this fight, they are all lined the exact same. KO, sub, and um, decision are all plus 300 because they don't know how this guy's going to win. If he does win, per se, once again, I'm not completely counting out gravely, but um, he uh, he's just very complex, man. Like, he's very intelligent in the way he fights. Now, on the flip side with gravely, like, Gravely's very, like, running and bust. Like, he needs to take you down. He needs to ground you. Like, he needs to go right then and there. And I think it's just kind of a bad matchup for him. I think Javid, even if he gets taken down, he'll be able to kind of wear on him. He's going to make Gravely work, even if he's on his back. And he's going to really just kind of put the pace on him as the fight progresses. So, I think the minus 195 isn't a terrible line on Javid because I think he's going to be able to ride in the spot fairly easily. Yeah, I agree with some of your breakdown there, man. I, although I'm potentially was on the Gravely side, I, I went back and forth on this one a little bit, but I think Gravely's sort of win condition as I went through tape started to wean a little bit. Um, really, if he takes him down, you're right. Javid Basharat's jujitsu is no joke. And I think that he'll he'll be active enough off of his back or active enough um, in a scramble to create problems for Gravely. And I don't know if that's going to bode well. Um you know, so if we're looking at it, I think that Gravely's win condition likely would be more up against the cage. Um, like I was saying, if he takes him down, I just think that that he will be active off the back. There'll be elbows, there'll be submission attacks, there'll be scrambles versus if Gravely can get him lean up against the fence, try to work some dominant position from there, land some strikes up against the cage, maybe land some bombs and, and close that distance to make it ugly. That's really the only way he's going to do it. And I think that he does have the strength of schedule there. Um so it can go back and forth, man. I think the where I take a shot on Gravely is that this goes over plus 150. Depending on the line and what it does this week and what people are listening to, I think there is a, a, a win condition there. I think this is a little bit tighter than, um, you know, what people were potentially thinking because I think this line is going to get wider right now. Um, so like I said, if it goes over plus 150, I'll take a shot on Gravely, but I fully see what you're saying. Javid's distance control, his distance management, his leg kicks – um, the way he uses his striking and, and is able to use his lateral movement and, and 
footwork to move side to side and get off the cage. Um, on top of that, he's just always active. He doesn't really accept position. That's going to be the key. He can't accept position. He's going to have to scramble and attack, attack, attack. And we've seen that in the past from him. So definitely think he could even potentially be the favorite side, but I think he's more minus 125. And if this crawls over plus 150, um, I'm jumping on the Gravely side. More of a value play again. But um, like I said, in a, in a fight card where there's just so many spots that are so tightly knit, I'm going to try to find that angle. And I think that potentially would be one if it crawls over that line. So definitely see your spot because um, I was back and forth on it, like I said. But might be a value boy play for me. Next fight in the card and last fight for us to talk about, I guess, first first fight of the night. I always do that when I, when I break that down. on Nicholas Moda or Nicholas Mata against Cameron Van Camp. And uh, this one is going to potentially be – I see why this is starting off the night. Um, this is going to be a fun fight to watch. We have Van Camp who comes in at – and I'm going to let you take the lead on this one, but we have Van Camp coming in at plus 170 against uh, minus 210. Uh, Van Camp, pressure is going to be there. He's landing roughly, at least in his last fight, he was landing seven strikes landed per minute. Um, there is some wrestling there as well, too, and some potential submission attack. But really, I think he's just going to want to keep it on the feet. I just From the style of fighter he is and what he's shown in the past, he's going to probably want to keep it on the feet to do so. I don't think that's a smart idea. I think that uh, he will likely get tagged on the way in. He, he overextends. He, he's the, similar to what I was saying about the pace and pressure uh, before. It, it, it's, he'll, he'll pressure forward. He leaves his head right out there. Um, it's hanging right out there to be touched by, you know, you, you can hit him probably three times to his, his one. Um, and that's what that's what Mata does. Uh, Nick Gosmoda will come in and he may push the pace at times, but really he's looking to counter you. And then when he does counter, he counters with a flirt. Um, the only thing I don't like about him is when he counters with that flurry, he does leave his head out there. If he gets count recountered, that's where his problem will be. But when when he'll wait for you to come in, you land one or two, or or sort of they block off his high guard, and then he just throws. And you know he's landing maybe two of the five shots that he's throwing there. But he, you're likely to get clipped in one of those counter flurries um, from Mata. And he's got power in his hands as well, too. He was just sort of caught by Miller in that situation where he sort of left himself hanging out there. Um, so, man, he does get hit, too. This should be a war. I think this could potentially be a fight of the night, to be honest. Um, it's very hard to say the way that this would play. But I do like the KO of Mata, but it's only plus 120. So I really don't think there's value on that at all. Um, so really it's going to be a no bet. I'm probably going to stay off it. The violence might be there, but I think the violence was juiced. It's why I didn't write it down here. Um, so really I, I'm going to go on the Nicholas Mata side of this. I think that Ben can just not as defensively sound as he needs to be. I think his pressure will be there. And I think that there is a slight submission attempt or a slight submission, um, situation, but really when it comes down to it, I think that uh, he's going to get tagged up for three rounds, likely a, a mode of dis decision. If not, we'll see maybe, maybe a violent spot, but I don't know, man. Um, like I said, I'm going to stay off of it and just enjoy it. What would you take on this one? Complete opposite. I think Van Camp beats the shit out of Moda. I think with Moda, like, as much as he's got good striking and stuff like that, Van Camp's got a heavy reach advantage, bigger fighter. And honestly, like, I think he's kind of fought the better level of competition, too. Fialo fight, man, he was piecing him up. And, like, don't get me wrong, I was never on the Fiello hype train. We all cashed if you're smart on Jake Matthews. Don't know why they gave us such a line on that. But nonetheless, like, Moto got killed by Jim Miller. And if you look at Van Camp, man, guy's super good on the ground. Clean striking. You pointed out the obvious. Keeps his chin down hella low. I apologize for my cat who wants to play right now. He's sick, so he's no, not being I, I didn't. Me. That's what I was saying. I'm going to argue with you on this one. We may have to turn this one into something because – I don't think he leaves his chin tight at all. I mean, no, he that's gets what I mean. tagged. Keeps it, no, no, he keeps it low. He keeps it low. But I think, dude, you got killed by Jim Miller. Like, are you, if you even – but you tell me that if he engages, like, you see the – dude, Van Camp had Fiello on skates. Don't get me wrong. I don't think Fiello's got the best chin either. But rewatch that fight. Fiello was on skates. And he just landed a crisp counter and he put him out. Is Moore going to do that? Maybe. But is – if Jim Miller's going to KO his ass, you tell me that Van Camp won't. Dude, and I just – I know we're going back and forth. I like this, though. This, and this is the first fight of the and night. And think about it. Van Camp's – most of his wins are by uh, by submission, right? He's only got one uh, win by KO. So, if anything, that grappling is going to be heavy in this fight. And you're going to take away Moda's win condition. And even then, if he clips Moda, Moda starts swinging heavy. If he shoots that takedown – 
that choke's gonna be there all day. So I, I think Van Camp wins, man. I think he gets him out of there. I think Van Camp's gonna sh- to to keep it striking. He's gonna know he's just because that's what he did, and like you saw that in the last fight. Yeah, I I see what you you saw in the Fialo. He definitely was tagging him up and pushing the pace. That's why you know strikes landed were almost seven. But when he goes in for the kill. He leaves himself so exposed, and when he strikes, oh, yeah. <laughs> he leaves himself really so exposed. His chin is right. just up there to fucking you could you could fucking serve breakfast on his chin. It's just just chilling up there, waiting to be hit. And I think that with Nicholas, he just his hooks are there all day long, and those hooks touch the chin. It's sleepy time. I get the Miller thing, I understand, but you and I are gonna go head to head. I think I think that will add some value to this one. Um, we're gonna have to figure out maybe if we do another podcast by the end of the week. Then we'll come up with something on this fight. I think we're gonna have to, to go head to head on this one. But uh I do see your angle. I just think that uh coming off of both of them coming off of KO, that's why we can find ourselves on the opposite sides of the fence on this, I guess. But uh I'm gonna go one side, you go the other. I wasn't gonna make it a strong play, but I may have to, at least as far as ego, um, and what I saw on take and what you saw on take. All right, man. So I think uh we, we found some good spots. Let's just sort of recap. I stayed off quite a bit, but I found some spots that I do like though. Um, obviously for ego, we'll look at the first fight. I'm going to stay on the Moda side or the Mata side, whatever multiple pronounced pronunciations. Um, you're on Van Camp. Um, I'm slightly on Gravely if it goes to value, but I totally see the Bastrat side. I think he is that good. And I think he's going to potentially prove it, but I think Gravely also could squeak out a victory in that one. Um, that Gapapa, I think she's going to get submitted. I just think that's it. Plus 255 on Bodog right now. Um, but anything around close to 200, just, I think he got to, I think, I think that that's, what's going to happen. I don't see really landing it any other way. I think even if, uh, Gapava were to tag Robertson, I think Robertson's going to be able to, um, you know, keep it on the ground if, if uh, Gapava gets it there and then scrambles to a jiu-jitsu, um, dominant position. So, uh, Trey Ogden, Zellheber, I don't know, man, like, where do you really, I could go each one, one by one, but where do you really see your angles on this? The ones that you really want to hammer. Um, I know we're both on Damon Jackson, but what do you, what do you think? Yeah, just give me a sec here. Um, well, I think obviously we got to start with Corey Sandhagen, man. I think that's kind of the minus one ninety five. I like. Yeah, I think it's just the safest play. Um, I think there's just one of these cards, man, where you just like you play the strengths, right? Like you know, there's gonna be violence, and you know what to expect, like Chitty, Greg. You know, are going to get violence in the spot, right? So, um, I'm heavy on Javin against Gravely. Um, Robertson, I wouldn't touch, man. Like, once again, like, I wouldn't touch any women's MMA on this, except for Sarah McMahon by decision, plus 200. I smashed their shit all day. Um, Damon Jackson is obviously our dog of the week. And I think our sneaky play is going to be the hernandez Barrio fight goes to decision at plus 130. I think that's the best way to attack So, it. sneaky play of the week. Barrio and Hernandez go to the decision at plus 130, you said? Yeah. Damon Jackson, dog, at plus 155. Um, if we go down to the top of the card, I, I really don't have like, the violence play on Andrew Kawani and Rodriguez. I like it's a, It's probably going to get a little juicy. If you want to touch it now, do it. Um, Pfeiffer is just, there's no way to touch that fight. We got Sanhagen, Moneyline, um, and we'll stick to that. But for that, I mean... I think we're gonna have to try to find a betting angle for us, you and I, on the first fight of the night. That's it. That's it. All right. Rest man. in peace, Elias Deodoro. God bless you. Rest in peace, Elias. The ultimate fighter, Elias Theodoro. You better get that hair on full display here. Thank you so much. This is honestly an amazing thing. I, I, I thank you, everyone from Quebec City. Thank you, everyone around the world watching. This is honestly the greatest moment of my life, and I'm so happy to share it with all of you. Want to take a quick look back at the fight? It was really all about your strike, and after those first two minutes, you dominated the action there, Adam. You even mixed in a hello to your mother in between fight action. Pretty good stuff. Yes, yes, I don't know. I, my mom's here, my dad's here, my brother's here. They're my rock, man. They, they, they mean everything to me, and all my family and friends that came here. Honestly, I'm going to cry like a Yes, yes, yes. This is the most amazing, amazing thing I've ever happened to me. I'm honestly in the names of uh, Stephen Bonner, what's it called, Forrest Griffin, Rashad Evans, the list goes on, man. That, my name is amongst that. And my, and my, and my good friend, Chad LaPriest. Um, amen to that guy, man. He's, he kicks butt, too. You joined that elite company, and you did so with style points tonight. Let's hear it one more time. Your ultimate fighter winner, Elias Theodoro.